Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be, we will begin shortly. All right, hello once again and welcome to today's training, a panel discussion on faith-based healing and coping practices among Afghan Muslims. This is the second part of a two-part spirituality series presented to you by Switchboard, a one-stop resource hub for refugee service providers in the United States. You can find the first installment of this series on our website by searching for Understanding Proselytism and Culturally Responsive Faith Sharing with refugees and other newcomers. For today, I'd like to start with a quick overview of your settings in Zoom for our webinar. Since we are in the Zoom webinar format, you are joining on listen-only mode. You may switch your audio for your computer or phone at any time under audio settings in the lower left corner of your screen. Due to the large number of learners on today's webinar, we've disabled learner use of the chat box. However, you do have the option to send questions to the speakers and co-facilitators via the Q&A function, which you can find on the ribbon at the bottom of your Zoom window. While we have a prepared list of questions that we will be asking panelists today, we will likely have time at the end to answer additional questions from participants who use the Q&A box. Please also keep an eye on the chat for messages from Switchboard and links to various resources we'll be mentioning throughout. Today's session will run for one hour and is being recorded. You'll receive an email with the recording, slides, and recommended resources within 24 hours. The webinar transcript, along with the recording, will also be posted on the Switchboard website within the following days. With that, I am delighted to introduce our esteemed speakers for today. We have a great crowd lined up. First, we have Dr. Omar Reda, a board-certified psychiatrist, Harvard-trained trauma expert, and advocate for the mental health of Muslims, immigrants, and refugees. He is the author of many books, including Untangled and The Wounded Healer, and has built healing programs for trauma survivors in the United States and abroad. Dr. Rita's passion for healing focuses on tackling family dysfunction and youth vulnerability resulting from trauma. Dr. Jacob Bentley, is a licensed clinical psychologist and acting associate professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He also serves as a clinical supervisor for an asylum evaluation network in the Seattle area, where he facilitates volunteer medical and mental health evaluations as part of applicants' asylum legal determination processes. With over 15 years of experience collaborating with newcomer communities, his research focuses on the impacts of forced displacement on the health and well being of refugees and asylum seekers. Next, we have Dr. Sadiq Popal. He is the founder and president of the Noor Islamic and Cultural Community Center, a nonprofit organization that strives to serve the religious, educational, and social needs of the growing Muslim community of Contra Costa County and surrounding communities in Northern California. In addition to his leadership role at NICCC, Dr. Popal is a professor at the University of San Francisco and teaches applied linguistics. Next, we have Alia Salman, who works with the International Rescue Committee and comes to our panel with a breadth of experience working directly with impacted individuals, particularly from newcomer populations. In past roles, she has worked on issues of gender inequity, learning differences between immigrant and naturalized children, culturally specific domestic violence prevention, and frontline refugee resettlement. She is originally from Karachi, Pakistan. And last but not least, we have Medina Masumi, who is a switchboard training officer focusing on cultural awareness. She has 12 years of experience as a licensed K through 12 school counselor and previously worked as a case manager for public assistance programs. As the daughter of Afghan refugees, Medina, Medina has experienced firsthand the challenges of refugee integration. She holds a Master of Education in School Counseling from George Mason University. Medina speaks fluent Dari and is proficient in Spanish. Here are today's learning objectives. By the end of today's session, we hope you will be able to, one, 
recognize how spirituality and faith-based practices can help Afghan Muslims cope with traumatic and challenging experiences, and two, describe faith-based community programs and interventions for Afghan newcomers. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Medina, to ground our conversation in faith-based healing practices. Thank you so much, Rob, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and dive in here. Um, the first thing we wanna start you guys out with is that uh, Slido, it's an interactive activity uh, that we wanna ask you, what does faith-based healing mean to you? Um, so to answer this question, if you could just take out your cameras uh, on your iPhone's camera, you can scan the QR code or you can go to slido.com and enter that corresponding code, 1387-363. And just uh, if you could just respond on what, what does faith-based healing mean to you? Prayer, trusting God for help. Community gathering. Lots about prayer and encouraging healing based off of beliefs, religion, meditation, right? Guidance, wonderful. Lots of amazing answers coming in uh all you know different and some similar and based off of what faith-based healing means to you and there's really not a wrong answer to this i appreciate you guys' responses and as they come on um i can just basically say that there isn't one set definition for faith-based healing but for a guide that we recently created in switchboard we referenced the fact that it's really a wide spectrum of supportive practices things like you guys mentioned prayers rituals services that are really based on a person's religious uh, beliefs such as a belief in a higher power for example and these beliefs and these practices really can make people, it can help them create a sense, um, make sense of the hardships that they go through and really move towards acceptance and wellness. We can move on to the next Slido. We have another uh, question for you guys, and it says, in your opinion, why might faith-based practices be beneficial to Afghan newcomers? That is our focus for today. So please go ahead and um, answer that question for us. Lots of trauma, they are religious. Building a new community abroad, faith is beneficial to everyone. Yeah, lots of uh, beliefs around Afghans being religious, connection, developing trust, high devotion to faith. Yeah, offers continuity. Wonderful, thank you for all these amazing responses. All great ideas, um, lots of different feedback on this. Sadness to leave home, cultural healing and faith. All right, thank you. Thank you for those uh, responses. And we're gonna sort of dive in to give you guys a little bit more context. So faith-based supports can really help, um, sorry about that, faith-based supports can really help decrease sort of social isolation and create that sense of belonging and help newcomers heal from trauma and the resettlement stressors that they go through. So in the past year at Switchboard, uh, we were hearing a lot from service providers about their observations when they've been working with newly arrived Afghans. And there was a lot of discussion and emphasis that clients were placing on their faith, which is really Islam is 99% uh, is the faith for 99% of Afghans. Um, so we also, Having said that, want to be cognizant that this really doesn't apply to necessarily every client um, because there is a spectrum with faith. But there was sort of a need for service providers to have a broader understanding of how they could help their clients lean in on their faith as a coping mechanism if they wanted to, um, to help them deal with the migratory or the resettlement stressors that they were facing. So in February of 2023, Switchboard published a guide called Faith-Based Healing Among Afghan Muslims with the support of Dr. Rita, who's one of our panelists today, and you're going to hear from him later. And also some of the research that Dr. Bentley has done in this area was referenced in our guide as well, which we will learn about as well later today. Um, but the purpose of this guide was really to help service providers working with newly arrived Afghans um, to give them a basic understanding of Islam and also sort of highlighting how mental health is conceptualized among Afghans. 
Um, typically, Afghans don't have a specific language for mental health uh, challenges or concerns. So the guide also goes over idioms of distress that you might hear your clients talking about when they're referring and they're expressing um, distress or how they feel. But one really important factor that we want to point out is that as a service provider, you can consider faith-based healing practices to be useful to explore with clients just as much as you might um, consider other legitimate secular mental health resources. And also, you don't have to be the same faith or even the same background as your client if you're assisting them and seeking faith-based support. So that's an important piece to remember. The most important takeaway is really to make sure that you understand that every single person is coming with their own sort of unique and individual perspective and background and to ask questions to gain clarity and listening without judgment are really important to helping um, your clients share with you about their religious or uh, practices or their beliefs. And we will have this uh, linked as a resource for you on our slide deck as well, which will be shared uh, in the next 24 hours. So I'm not going to dive too much into this uh, slide because, as I said, it is referenced within our uh, guide. Um, but basically, a big part of the guide that we provided was that there's five fundamental uh, pillars of Islam or sort of practices for Muslims. And each one uh, sort of has a different practice that we have in the guide, which could heal, uh, help with healing. And the first one is called Shahada which means testimony, and it's the declaration of faith among Muslims. And this is something that Muslims recite at least a couple times a day, if not more, um, which means that there's only one God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And so most Muslims will repeat this in the morning. They usually say it out loud if they're washing their face or cleansing, and if they go to sleep at night. Um, and it can serve as a healing practice for Muslims because re that recitation um, brings comfort to a person that, that um, needs to feel safe if they are leaning on God or a higher power. Um, the, second, uh, the second pillar is called Salat or Namaz, and it's uh, Namaz as it's referred to by Afghans. And it's the practice of praying five times a day while facing in the direction of Mecca. And the prayers include reciting parts of the Quran uh, using a prayer mat or a rug. And Salat really serves as a healing practice because it involves ritualistic movements, um, which can provide physical and meditative benefits. The third pillar is Sawam or fasting, which occurs once uh, every year during the ninth lunar month, which is the month that we are currently in right now. It's the month of Ramadan. So you might notice a lot of your clients uh, observing Ramadan this month. And so fasting provides healing through the sort of limiting your unhealthy food consumption. It's considered like a spiritual cleanse. Um, you're looking after others in the community. There's more sense of community that takes place this month. And Muslims also believe that during this month, um, their prayers will be counted almost for extra and answered by God, which provides a sense of hope as a sort of a healing tool. The fourth pillar is zakat, which means purification. It involves donating a percentage of your wealth annually. And Muslims believe that this practice helps purify your heart and sort of uh, takes you away from the feeling of greed or also just remembering less fortunate and sharing your wealth. And it serves as a healing practice um, because it really can help you focus on, on practicing gratitude and imp improves a person's sense of happiness. The fifth pillar is Hajj, which is a pilgrimage um, that every Muslim sort of aims to take at least once in their lifetime. Um, and the pilgrimage is to Mecca, and within Mecca is called the Kaaba, which is a building that's referred to as the House of God. Uh, for Muslims, the pilgrimage to Mecca uh, really is a healing practice because it reminds them that they're all part of a sort of a global community, or a Oma, as they would call it. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So now we're just going to talk briefly and do another Slido about um, the importance of community support, uh, faith-based community support for Afghan newcomers. So if we go on to the next one, we have one more Slido, and that is how can faith-based community organizations provide support for newly arrived Afghans? So if you guys can go ahead one last time and answer this question, that would be great. And then we will go forward. 
providing prayer rooms and mats, yeah, like a space for prayer, being accepting of their religion. Sense of home, space for worship, coaching. Yes, all wonderful responses. And as they're coming in, um, we can go on entering. Yeah, lots of different things, community coach. We're going to talk about this more in depth with our panelists, but it's communities uh, can provide healing spaces in so many ways. Uh, again, we're going to hear specifically more from our panelists about this, but they can really reduce those feelings of social isolation and help to restore help, uh, hope among newcomers. That's a huge part of it. And one of the things that I just want to quickly emphasize is that service providers play such a large role in helping to sort of facilitate and bridge this connection between your clients and these community resources that could be faith-based. Because a lot of times when newcomers come in, they don't know where these places are or who they should go to or what they can do. And so really bridging that gap as a service provider can be a very powerful thing to do um, and creating those connections between clients and uh, Islamic community leaders or imams um, are, it's very important. It can help clients really uh, sort of cope with those stressors better and um, have that support that they need. So with no further ado, we will go ahead and start um, asking some of our amazing experienced knowledgeable panelists some questions. You guys can turn on your cameras. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead, Dr. Rita and, um, ask you a question since you had a large part in the guide that we helped create. But in addition to some of the healing sort of uh, faith-based practices that I talked about, what ways do you think um, that faith-based healing can ha be helpful to Afghan newcomers? Yeah, thank you, Medina. It's uh, nice to be with you. And uh, of course, the uh, first thing to remember that like any other community, Afghans come with uh, lots of richness and diversity. So making sure that we don't make assumptions or generalizations and Islam itself, it's a practice along a spectrum. So making sure that, you know, we meet people where they are, making sure that we uh, listen to their story. Uh, and my experience so far with the Afghan community has been in two states, uh, the state of Oregon, where uh, we did, uh, you know, trauma-informed healing center camps and retreats for children using actually uh, traumatized horses that have been rehabilitated to help children who might have been through trauma. And the other one, currently the state of Colorado, where I recently moved, working with the Afghan fathers. So focusing on uh, lots of uh, family bonding, making sure that people uh, you know, have sense of belonging, building a trust, focusing on identity, and making sure that you know, this community uh, does not you know, lose the American dream, chasing the American dream, which means you know, we want to focus on the family unit, making sure that the children who go to schools and then come home, there is not uh, too many, uh, you know, frictions or arguments between family, me family members. So I, I've been involved in lots of uh, education in that regard. And I think, you know, the role of uh, the mosque and the imams is uh, really important here, making sure that uh, most of our imams should have some kind of psychosocial background and also uh, the wonderful healers, uh, everybody in the room here, at least be exposed to the Islamic traditions like what you did right now. Thank you for answering that um, so thoroughly. Speaking about the importance of the connection with the imams and the community-based healers, um, Dr. Popal, you work at the Noor Islamic Center based in California. So in your experiences, how do you think a mosque or a community-based support can help provide that healing space for Afghan newcomers? What are some examples that you could give us? Uh, well, first of all, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, and then those of you that you're you know, observing Ramadan, I'd like to say Ramadan Mubarak. And I'd like to also thank you and Switchboard for including me in this very informative panel. Uh, to answer your question, uh, the, what I'm going to say is mostly applies to New Islamic and Cultural Community Center uh, in Concord because we do things that probably some of the other mosques may not do. Uh, so first of all, all mosques provide a space for Muslims to come, socialize, communicate with another, seek help, and give help. 
So this is that kind of a space. And Noor Islamic and Cultural Community Center, of course, exactly does that. And as uh, Dr. Reda mentioned, that these imams, at least our imam is educated, was educated over here. He speaks fluent English and we attract not only Afghans, but Muslims from all other uh, parts of the world. And the language that connects everybody is English, Arabic, and also Farsi and Pashto that is spoken uh, uh, there. But most of the preaching is done in English and the prayers are done in Arabic. So the Imam that they leads prayers, they pray for the welfare, good health, success, and forgiveness for everybody. And this is the fact that he's praying for success. And these people that have come to the United States they came shocked, as you all know, because we're all in this business together, that when a person leaves his or her country, uh, they go through stages of acculturation. And the first stage is what? Excitement. And then culture shock, then gradual recovery, then full recovery. For these Afghans, they never saw the excitement. They lived the country shocked. And they are some of them are still shocked being here because the newness of the surrounding, surrounding that they live in it just gives them shock and a sense of bringing, bringing them pleasure. And, and so that contributes. They need, as you said, some place to go and heal, some place that they can go and relate, to talk to people who could empathize with them. And so also the other thing, the other mix with it in this thing is that they also come from a collectivist culture and which requires other things. And they come here, it's very individualistic. So to fit, the mosque basically brings the two together because this brings all these people that are what? They connect them and they practice mostly what? That collectivist types of traditions and cultures. So when they come here, they participate in dua. A lot of them, they need the dua because they suffer so much. They are shocked, as I mentioned. They have lived, half of their family is in Afghanistan. They're worried about them. The other half is somewhere in England. The other half is still in Qatar. The other, you know, some of them are over here. They are basically traumatized and they need somebody to pray for them. And that's when the mosque and the imam comes. The, um, the mosque also provides, and the way we do it, we bring them here, we invite them and, and, and we try to show that they, that they, they, it's not just to show, but we believe that they matter to us and we care about them. And to show that we invite uh, the, seniors from our community, from the board of direct directors, and also officials of the city, like the mayor, the council members, the police chief, they come like regularly and they shake hand with these newly arrived Afghans and tell them to welcome to America, welcome to Concord. That makes a huge difference that they come and they are welcome. We do everything because of just what you said, and your previous you know, webinar and now, and what Dr. Reda said, that they are suffering, they're in shock, they need healing. And one way to heal is what? To bring them to this peaceful place, mosque, and also to bring people who could make this a lot more possible. Another thing that the mosque can help them with, and this has been really, we they've been very, very helpful, is the fact that they see other Afghans that they, they came before them and succeeded. So this gives them kind of indirectly the feeling that if they could do it, we can do it. And that helps. And in addition to that, they also learn about other programs of the mosque, like heritage language program, because a lot of them are worried. What will happen to my kids? Will my kids grow up like these other kids that they will not, you know, because they're individualistic, that they will lose their religion, they will lose their language, they will lose their culture. That's another worry that they have. So in the mosque, we provide these heritage language programs. We teach them Dari, Farsi, Pashto. We teach them how to read, how to write, how to speak, age appropriate, grade appropriate language. And that brings peace to them that yes, my kids are going to be both Afghans, American and Muslim. Not, they're not going to lose their culture and religion. So this is another way that mosque can help and bring comfort to these immigrants for both kids and also we help the kids themselves by having these heritage language program to value their language and culture and also we we have this after school program that because their english is not to the level that they could succeed in school some of them are surviving some of them are failing 
we provide this after school program and provide bilingual support. We provide ESL instruction, math instruction, homework help, computer literacy, in order to these kids are put on the right path of success. That's what we do. And I don't want to take too much time from other people, other uh, panelists. There are a lot of informative people over here. But if there are other questions from me later on, I could certainly uh, talk about that. I could talk about that. But for now, all I can say is that our mosque, New Islamic and Cultural Community Center, provides a space for these people to heal, to find peace, to find friendship, and to connect with others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. And it, you did such a good job explaining all the different facets of what a faith-based or a community support center can do, even outside of just the religious piece, um, to provide so many layers of support for families. That's important. I just want to reference that uh, you mentioned, and daddy, the word du'a, and for the listeners coming in that might not know what that means, that means prayer, right? Du'a is prayer. Um, and so I'm going to shift gears here and go into a little bit more of a research piece of this with Dr. Bentley, who's actually ran programs in mosques, um, sort of that support faith-based uh, and has done interventions. Dr. Bentley, can you talk to us a little bit about what the research indicates um, on how faith-based support interventions can support Muslim refugees or migrant populations. Yeah, thank you for that, Medina, and um, much gratitude for uh, including um, me in the panel here. Uh, and a lot of what I'll, I'll say here um, is very consistent with uh, what uh, doctors um, Papal and uh, Rada have mentioned already in terms of the, the context being so important um, in the community location. Uh, I guess I'll just start by saying um, that research into faith-based intervention programs and you know, specifically uh, what I'll call kind of formalized structured interventions is still very much developing in the research um, literature, but it's grown a lot in the last 10 to 15 years, and we've learned an immense amount um, particularly from um, Muslim communities uh, um, implementing uh, mental health programs uh, from a faith-based perspective. And one of the things that we've learned is that while, um, as um, Dr. Popal was mentioning, um, while many people respond uh, and receive such um, support and community and healing from being connected to community structures and uh, programs through mosques, um, and receiving um, kind of informal um, mental, mental health services through that mechanism uh, that brings healing to many, many people. Uh, and, uh, and we've also learned that there are some individuals who uh, uh, continue to have distress in response to prior experiences and challenges that they may have had um, as well. And so um, one of the kind of emerging areas is better understanding what what kinds of programs can be developed for, for those people uh, who may need something that's a little bit uh, more formalized from a mental health service provision perspective, something that is um, really faith-based and integrated and located within those community structures uh, where people um, reside and, and find um, comfort. And so that's sort of the, the next uh, growing edge. And all of this um, also uh, is, um, from a research kind of evidence-based perspective, um, culminating at the same time that we've learned a lot about um, ideas, concepts uh, around uh, positive religious coping and what that looks like um, for forgiveness. Um, and we found that um, those behaviors around forgiveness and um, community orientation uh, within religious contexts um, uh, predicts uh, satisfaction with life and quality of life for um, uh, uh, newly arriving um, uh, community members from um, Muslim um, uh, uh, predominant countries. Um, and we've also learned that um, what we call negative religious coping or sort of avoidant behaviors or, or anger um, that might be experienced in, within religious context um, predicts um, less favorable outcomes. And so it's kind of understanding both sides of those and interacting with both sides of um, those from an intervention perspective. Um, the, the current evidence right now um, shows that um, approaches that are community developed, uh, oriented to cultural sources of wisdom, including 
uh, religious ways of understanding um, that focus on bringing people together. That's a common theme that we've heard, I think, um, already from uh, people who've spoken, um, bringing people together and, and, and strengthening those um, social connections and supports and those um, services that integrate um, evidence-based uh, treatment uh, approaches um, with uh, core Islamic uh, principles are particularly uh, promising. Um, and so um, uh, one of the programs that we've been working on uh, here uh, in the Seattle area and um, in the um, uh, Columbus, Ohio, um, uh, uh, Somali community in which we're um, now beginning to adapt for um, for uh, Af newly arriving Afghan community members is um, called Islamic Trauma Healing. This is the one, one of the ones that was mentioned in the uh, switchboard document, uh, Medina, that you were uh, talking about before. And Islamic Trauma Healing um, is, uh, is one attempt to incorporate um, cognitive and behavioral treatment approaches, um, such as cognitive restructuring or interacting with those ways that uh, people's patterns of thinking about themselves, the world, and other people uh, might have shifted in response to traumas and challenges that they've experienced. You know, the world is a dangerous place, or uh, I'm not uh, comp a competent person to, to manage the challenges that are in front of me, those kinds of negative um, beliefs, uh, and, um, and trauma-related avoidance, or kind of pushing away the, the memory and the emotion that um, experienced um, as a result of, of, um, of trauma. And uh, this particular program, and there's lots of different ways that this could be done, but um, this particular program uh, addresses distressing thoughts about the self, the world, and other people through uh, prophet stories uh, from the Quran uh, and uh, interacts with avoidance related to trauma through dua uh, or prayer uh, with Allah, a very kind of trauma-focused um, prayer that evolves over the course of this group-based um, uh, mosque-located um, six-session intervention. Um, and the six sessions follow a thematic arc, beginning with um, the prophet Ayub, um, uh, focused on the theme of faith during hard times, and um, ultimately culminates with a focus on reconciliation and growth um, uh, in the final session with Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him. Um, like I said, there's lots of different uh, approaches that could um, that could be uh, implemented, kind of drawing on those um, those themes. But what seems to have worked well within the context of Islamic trauma healing is that the real integration of um, addressing known um, drivers of um, distress uh, for people who've experienced a high trauma burden uh, with those core uh, faith principles um, that resonate with them. Thank you, Dr. Bentley. Um, just to piggyback off of what you've already talked about and done such a great job explaining some of this uh, existing programming, if I were to be a service provider or an organization and had an idea to start a similar program within a faith-based community, how does one even go about that? Where do you start? Yeah, I, I, I can take a first pass at that. I'm sure there's lots of other uh, wisdom in the, in the group here. Um, you know, I, I, for in, in our experience, um, both uh, locally and, um, and internationally, as we've um, engaged this work, it, it, it really begins with the recognition of the wealth of resources that naturally exist within the community. Um, and uh, beginning to, uh, if if the community-based organization, say, is not one that is um, like Dr. Popal's, uh, that is so integrated within the natural structures of the community, making sure that those community leaders from the very beginning are um, like core key collaborators that shape the form of whatever the inter intervention is from the very beginning, as opposed to I'm trying to take something that is already built um, and exporting that to another um, setting that it has to be co-developed and it has to be um, uh, based on the the wisdom of of the community um, that you're that you're working with. And that's been our attempt with the 
uh, Islamic Trauma Healing Program, like I mentioned, um, began in collaboration with the Somali community. We're now working with local um, uh, leaders of the Afghan community here in the um, larger uh, Seattle area to make an ad adaptation to that uh, program there. But it starts with a needs assessment from uh, the community and having that drive the process. And, and not only a needs assessment, but also um, uh, an understanding of the areas of expertise um, that are there in the community um, and uh, and the methods of addressing uh, questions and concerns that exist within the community and, and having those things really drive what uh, a faith-based mental health intervention um, might look like um, for, uh, for that specific purpose. Do any of the other panelists have anything else to add to that as well? Or I think one of the things that's come up as a question um, uh, participants even asking is how would you sort of blend that mental health um, background into and enter it into a faith-based community organization and how can you collaboratively sort of work together? Uh, like the needs assessment you mentioned is a great starting point and making sure what you know, getting an assessment of what resources you have at your disposal within a community and who can help. But um, sometimes taking those initial steps is difficult as to like where you start. Yeah, I can jump in really quick. Um, I don't want to get out of the way for other people. Uh, with Islamic Trauma Healing, we've, we've positioned it as a healing program, as a faith healing program and not a mental health intervention because of high rates of stigma. Um, in certain pockets of the community. And so really focusing on the healing in the faith and having the, the vehicle of the, the program, the mental health uh, machinations of the program uh, be kind of underlying that. Um, but front and center are the kind of faith and community uh, uh, aspects. Yeah. Can I add something to the sure. question that you posed? Okay, first of all, um, again, thank you. And uh, uh, first, I think both Dr. Reda and Dr. Bentley established that uh, the immigrants need uh, uh, to, to make connections with the faith-based organizations such as the mosques in order to kind of bring some healing to the issues that they may have uh, uh, because of the trauma they've experienced. Uh, so we basically focused on the immigrants to make that connection. Uh, but I think those that they serve the needs of the immigrants, these uh, uh, um, community-based uh, organizations, uh, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, they also need to connect with the uh, uh, Islamic you know, organizations such as mosques, for example. So they need to know uh, and get in touch with them. So as, as Dr. Bentley mentioned, the needs assessment to see what is it that they need. So every mosque uh, for the uh, information of those that they uh, do not know about the structure of mosque, uh, they are considered non-profit organization 501c, most of them, and by law, they have to have a board of directors. And so the board of director as a director and also uh, are a president. So they need to connect. So if you just go to the mosque and talk to anyone, it's not going, it's not going to help them. So what they need to do is to find those board members and to connect with them or make connections at least with the president or one of the board members. The issue that they may experience is that not all board members may be fluent in English and may understand because what you are talking about is a very abstract topic. And it is, you need certain level of proficiency in English or any language in order to understand such, kind of, such a abstract uh, topic. So you need to find someone from the board member who is fluent in English and can then understand why you are asking what you want to do and, and so that that person can help you. So once you establish that connection with a board member or a president of the board, then you could find out what the needs are and where your organization comes. You could go there and kind of find a way to kind of honor their services. You could have some of your meetings over there. Uh, but each mosque or all mosques have certain requirements for the way that you enter the mosque. So you need to, you know, those service organizations, they need to learn that. And once those things happen and they make, they make that connection, they will be able to, uh, to take advantage of this connection with the mosque in order to serve 
their clients better and then lead their connections, bring their, their, their clients to the mosque. Sometimes finding a mosque is not easy for all the immigrants that they have come here. So probably the service provider need to do the research. What is the closest mosque? And then speaking of mosque and religion, and there are two different big, two big divisions, and that is the Shia Muslim and the Sunni Muslim. So if you bring a Sunni Muslim to a Shia mosque or a Shia Muslim to Sunni mosque, there may be a mismatch. So you need to really need to find out that the, the, your client is, let's say, a Sunni client. Then you need to show them, take them uh, to a Sunni mosque. The, per, the person's needs could be better served that way. And also vice versa, if it's a Shia person, you try to find a Shia mosque for them. And you can find that out by just talking to a mosque. Well, are you Shia Sunni? And I have this client and, and then I, I would like to bring them. And the best day to bring these clients on a, is a Friday. Uh, most of these mosques attract a lot of uh, worshipers on Friday. Like in our mosque, we get over 500, sometimes six to 700 on a Friday. And these people come, the Friday the prayer is only for a few minutes or probably 40 minutes, half an hour or so. But people stay on the campus because they want to talk, they want to socialize. So, so I encourage the service providers to connect with the mosque, connect with the board members, and then go and attend one of these Friday services. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Popal. Um, and also just to make one other additional point to that is that there's a lot of mosques that don't necessarily tar target their services or prayers to just Shia or Sunni. That's a very important statement I think I should make. Um, lots of very uh, inclusive mosques that welcome any and all Muslims. And so I don't necessarily think that you'd have to always ask what they are, but really just familiar, familiarize yourself with the community um, and who its members and leaders are. I'm going to shift gears here um, because I really have an important question for, um, for Elia as a Muslim uh, woman who's on this panel, um, in addition to myself. Um, it, we know that in Afghanistan, uh, in general, we've heard a lot about the fact that it's a patriarchal society and um, families are coming in facing and females are coming in facing lots of different challenges um, that men might not, right? And so one of the things that we know a lot of Afghan women have historically faced is uh, potential domestic violence or a lack of support systems. And so the mosque or faith-based community can really um, be essential. So I just wanted to ask you from the perspective of a female who is Muslim and has shared experiences also with the migrant population, how do you think that a mosque where faith-based support um, can support newly arrived Afghan women? Great question, and thank you for having me. Um, I think I'd like to start my answer by mentioning the unfortunate fact that the vast majority of all societies globally are patriarchal, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of the experiences that Afghan women face are not necessarily unique to them, but perhaps they manifest in a way that's unique to where they are from, right? Uh, there are women all over the world who are facing the exact same thing, but it just looks slightly different. Um, I think mosques and faith-based uh, service providers can do a better job at actively implementing programs targeted towards newcomers and newcomer women especially. I feel confident uh, actually in saying overall that mosques have a foundational and kind of unspoken vow to assist anyone who seeks help from them. Uh, but past experiences may deter women, especially from seeing their mosques as a place of help, even if they're already attending those places for religious services. Um, I think an implementation and explicit advertising of support would be really great. Programs would be a great place to start. So something like a, like a multi-course program that addresses immigration issues, financial advice, food aid, uh, language classes, childcare, um, and more, and perhaps something sp specific to the female population. A lot of masjids uh, already have this uh, in some form or another as part of their regular ongoing programming throughout the week. Food donation comes to mind as an immediate example. Um, so I would hope that it would not take too much to make specific programming for Afghan women um, a regular ongoing thing at any masjid across the USA or beyond. And I think also uh, for within the non-newcomer and non-Afghan community, it would be incredibly helpful for imams to incorporate these topics um, of gender, of being a newcomer, 
um, of what it's like to navigate a new uh, space and culture into their into their Friday sermons and emphasize the spirit of community and service that so many Muslims already resonate with. You know, um, as I mentioned, many women may not have may have had negative experiences within mosque before or working with uh, like religious communities, and that may also be true uh, of newcomer Afghan women. So it would make a world of difference for them to hear that they are specifically being mentioned with regards to support. Um, and to close off my answer, I think taking one step ahead, it would be incredibly helpful if mosques and faith-based organizations partnered with resettlement agencies, if they aren't already, to help implement their programming in a cohesive and robust way. Thank you so much, Elia, for that great response. And um, I think one of the most essential pieces that faith-based communities really provide for Afghan women or can potentially provide is also that sense of uh, dealing with that social isolation, right? That comes from potentially being kicked, uh, you know, or far removed from your family members who are still abroad and you're still dealing with that. And so having other females that you can connect with who understand and have a shared background with you can be so powerful and really be a really well utilized a coping skill. I'm gonna uh, address another question specifically to Dr. Rita. Uh, so while we have this important discussion of how we can lean on faith, then you have instances sometimes where clients, it's not just enough to solely lean on faith, right? They might need mental health uh, professional services, right? So how can a service provider or a mental health professional encourage their client with severe signs of distress or mental health problems to seek out a specialized treatment if they're reluctant and they're saying that they that the faith is enough as the healing tool? What can a service provider or a mental health professional do? Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, it's very explicit both in the Quran and also in the traditions of the Holy Prophet that we need to seek, you know, support. We need to find cure both uh, in, within and uh, out of our religious practices. So it's very important to point out the internal and external resources and making sure that there are verses in the Quran and also a hadith, which means traditions from the life of the Prophet that he was actively seeking a cure even if it meant uh, outside the you know, boundaries of Islam, as long as they are Islamically acceptable. What breaks my heart, I see many, uh, as a psychiatrist, like many times the uh, patient, if you like, the client is referred to me when it's very late in their suffering. So they are either acutely psychotic or acutely suicidal, or there is already family breakdown or divorce or domestic violence. So reaching out to the community in the beginning through many avenues we know not everybody will come to the mosque so i'm very impressed with the programs that were created within the mosque uh, understand also some people will see the mosque as a place of uh, trauma and they see their religion as a source of trauma because of uh, you know maybe misinterpretation of the sacred text or uh, practices that were violent or dismissive of their own identity when they were back in afghanistan so very important to build uh, programs that meet the diversity of uh, the community, but also making sure that you use examples from the Quran and Sunnah, reminding people that uh, healing is comprehensive. Yes, many times we might need medication. That's why we heal the body, uh, taking care of your biological needs. Uh, Islam and the religion might feed your heart, your social needs, and also your soul, your spiritual needs. But many times, you know, remember, we are made of uh, body, mind, heart, and soul. So the body and the mind, I think uh, they need extra support through and practices that might not exclusively religious. All right, I want to thank all of our panelists so far for the wonderful answers and responses they've provided to some of our prepared questions. And thank you, Medina, for moderating this discussion. I wanted to jump in now with some questions from our participants that have been coming in. And while we will not be able to answer all of the many questions that you have shared, uh, we're going to try and pull themes from some, some of the questions that you're asking and see what our panelists have to say about that. So here are some questions, and I'll try and direct some of these questions, but panelists, if you have anything to add after the initial person that I flagged, feel free to respectfully add. Uh, so I wanna start by noting that there are a lot of questions about some of these gender-based differences that are coming in. 
Um, particularly, for example, uh, one question was, if a Muslim newcomer is open to talk therapy, is that something that must always be provided by a counselor of the same gender? So I'm wondering if Alia and Medina, if you could answer this sort of question from your experience, uh, first to give an idea in that example, but also to talk about what do different services that could be offered uh, mental health wise look like depending on the sort of gender components. Yeah, I can jump in for that one. Um, and Alia, please feel free to chime in as well. Um, I think this is a very important question where you don't want to make any assumptions. It's very important to know your client and to see where their comfort level lies. Uh, in my experiences, I have seen where there are female uh, clients who might feel comfortable speaking to someone who is the opposite gender, but generally in Afghan culture, um, generally and historically, they will feel more comfortable speaking to a therapist or a service provider who is of the same gender. Um, and that is probably what's gonna be more widely accepted, even if it's, even if they're not, even if they're comfortable with it, somebody in their family might not be comfortable with it. So. Uh, I would err on the side of caution and try to make sure that it's same gender, but you can always ask and, and make sure, you know, get, gauge your client's comfort level on that. Yeah, I can attest to that too. And I think it also varies by age as well. Like just from my experience, I've noticed that um, younger folks are uh, more comfortable with sort of like a mixed environment, whereas someone who's more established or an older may not be, and that may also be rooted in trauma, not necessarily an aversion to speaking with men. Um, but I can plus one to everything you just said, Medina. Thank you, Medina and Alia. Any other of the panelists have anything to add on that? I would like to add that the language issue also comes. Mm. So not all men or women who have come here and they're suffering from these different health and mental health issues, they're fluent in English. So bringing a translator is another uh, issue that if you are having a, uh, if you have a female you know, patient or client, it will be, I think, advisable to bring a female translator, uh, or whether that, that, that uh, uh, person is seen by a male or female doctor, that doesn't matter, with a translator, somebody who could relate to, or the, the, the woman, could talk to the female person uh, very confidently. Also vice versa, if you have a male patient, uh, using a female translator may not work that well. Sometimes you may not be open that way. So language is a barrier, or language is an issue, translation is an issue. And so if it's possible at all, sometimes we don't have that, that luxury. If it's possible at all, if you can match the gender of the uh, translator uh, to the gender of the client, uh, when it comes to talking to uh, a mental health professional or a health professional will be very helpful. Absolutely. I think that's a really great point, especially even for folks who are born and raised in the U.S. speaking English. Uh, a lot of things, even within mental health, can be hard to talk about. So making sure that you have really responsive interpretation is essential. That's a really great point, Dr. Popal. I want to move to another question from someone. Uh, about uh, interactions between, you know, agencies and mental health providers and mosques and imams. So the question reads, I'm curious about consulting with religious leaders as part of regular practice. For example, how could a mental health practitioner best work with an imam to facilitate mental health and wellness during the resettlement process? Is this kind of consultation something that faith-based communities are open to? I'd like to open that to really anyone, but perhaps Dr. Rita, Dr. Bentley, Dr. Bhopal, talking about a lot of your uh, work across the aisle in that way. Yeah, I mean, my, my own experience has been really, I've been encouraged, you know, uh, as a psychiatrist, usually we uh, use to never talk about religion, but very recently there is movement towards, uh, you know, spirituality, and it's not only biopsychosocial approach, uh, we are adding the spiritual aspects to that, which is very encouraging. Uh, what I have found, uh, you know, there is lots of movement towards educating imams and at the same time making sure that, you know, the mental health, you know, service providers, they have uh, some curiosity and interest and in being humble, which I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by Dr. Bentley's, you know, approach. I, I, I have read the paper and um, using examples from the six holy prophets to just show that even 
people like the prophets go through adversity and trauma and how they use that to ground them and to be a source of healing to everybody around them. And so uh, we have used that. We have used uh, imams as a you know, connection with the community, not only in outpatient settings, even in inpatient units. Sometimes the client will ask for a consultation with a religious leader, and, and that's uh, their right and I think should be available. Thank you, Dr. Rita. Anything to add, Dr. Gopal or Dr. Bentley? Uh, well, uh, I would like to bring to your attention that uh, when it comes to the leadership of the uh, and mosques, uh, the imams are not always the the leader. They are the the preacher. They they lead prayers. But when you want when it comes to contact, there are other people. So the, we do, most mosques try to kind of have the separation of what called the state and. Uh, and church so the imam is doing the the spiritual part but to get the imam involved you have to re approach the board of directors you may not be the imam may not be able to, uh, to cooperate as much without the permission of the board of directors so you'll have to get in touch with the leaders of the um, uh, uh, mosque which may or may not include the imam himself uh, uh, but that's the way to approach it then you could lead, reach the imam uh, mm -hmm. like that like we get calls from people patients that are in the hospital and dying i get the call and say mm -hmm. we need somebody to come there and pray and then i call the imam and and then the imam goes and makes the prayers for him uh, right peace. so that kind of a thing yeah yeah i appreciate that so being really strategic about the kinds of partnerships that you're building within the community a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to work and that's why it's so important to have the experiences like you all who have had varied experiences in faith-based healing. And so I wanna say thank you again, again, again for your expertise on this call. And I want to unfortunately uh, bring us to a close on today's session. Uh, so thank you so much to our panelists and thank you to our participants for joining today. Uh, hopefully now you have been able to achieve our learning objectives that we set for today. Uh, for recognizing spirituality and faith-based practices and how they can help Afghan Muslims cope with traumatic and challenging experiences. And hopefully now you can also describe some faith-based community programs and interventions that are being practiced for Afghan newcomers and other Muslim newcomers in the United States. Very important to us is that we would love to ask for your help now. Uh, if you could take the next 30 seconds to pull out your phone and scan this QR code, or click the link in the chat uh, to provide some feedback about how today's session went. It's a short three question survey, like I said, less than 30 seconds to complete, and it helps us improve our training and technical assistance moving forward. If you really liked our session today, we'd love to hear from it. If you have comments or feedback on how we can continue to improve our training and technical assistance, we please do encourage you to include that as well in the comments. We're gonna give you about 30 seconds to fill that out now. All right, thank you to those of you who have filled it out so far. That will remain open and we will also be sending that out tomorrow as well with our recommended resources and other uh, resources from today. So just wanna reiterate, you will receive the recording, the slides and the recommended resources from today's session within 24 hours of the session. Uh, here's just a couple of the recommended resources that we wanna tease for you. Uh, be definitely sure to check out the faith-based healing guide that was referenced throughout today and was the impetus for this session. Uh, and shout out to Dr. Rita and uh, Medina for their work on that guide. Really grateful for that. And we hope that that can serve you well in guiding your own practice moving forward. And last but not least, we'd love to ask for you to stay connected with Switchboard. Uh, we would like to continue being at your one-stop resource hub. If you are a refugee service provider, uh, you can find us online at our website, switchboardta.org, where you can find our extensive resource library and several other notifications of events and trainings that are upcoming and relevant to your work. Add us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, find us there. 
Uh, and if you ever have a technical assistance request that you are looking for support in as a refugee service provider, you can reach out to us via our website at, us, at the menu that says submit a TA request, or you can email us at switchboard at rescue.org and inquire about whether Switchboard may be able to meet your technical assistance needs. Once again, thank you for attending today's training, and we wish you all the best in your practice moving forward. Ramadan Mubarak.